Welcome back, everybody. Tonight is an autonomy special guest. We have Dr. Frank Aida in the house. He, it's his, probably his third time here, right, Frank? Yeah. I think so. All right. So we're going to talk about his new book tonight. His book is called Taking Back Your Health, and it's the essential information you would need to know that he kind of talks about in these interviews that he would introduce to new patients. So you guys are among the first to hear about this content, to learn about the various areas of health that you might consider and maybe hadn't had focus on. And it's a really easy book. It's a very quick read, but it's an invaluable lifelong skill that you're learning. So you might not get it all in one pass. Frank, how you doing? Good, great, great. Go ahead and pull that mic up right about close like that. Absolutely. Why did you have to write this book now? Why hadn't you written it, written it before? What have you learned about these topics since you started practicing? Well, I think uh, it, it was the right time to write this book. I mean, I've seen, I've gone into my 19th year of practice. So I have a lot of experience under my belt seeing a wide array of different types of cases. And what led me to write this was, you know, I see patients on a daily basis that have gone to numerous physicians and just they're not getting the help that they need. And they're seeking me out because they're having a hard time trying to figure it out themselves, essentially. You know, uh, it's like, you know, you go to a doctor with a slew of symptoms and they run their usual testing. Um, they'll spend some time with you. And a lot of times they're not given the answers that they're looking for. Um, they're left saying, okay, we can just treat these symptoms. We do not know what's causing it. Um, and they come, they find, they find me and we kind of take a different approach to, uh, figuring out what's going on with them. Majority of these cases that I'm seeing there, there may not be an overt pathology yet, but it's on its way towards an overt pathology. And it's, I consider it more of a functional problem meaning it's due to some type of maybe dietary shortcoming, nutrient, nutrient deficiency, maybe a food sensitivity, food allergy, maybe an underlying infection that's not being addressed, a hormonal imbalance. And in conventional medicine, they a lot of times they fail to look at these particular factors. And that's what the whole book is designed to kind of bring to light. Okay, um, people will start thinking a little bit. It's, it's kind of thinking outside the box. Okay, uh, why do I have this symptom? What's my body telling me with this type of symptom? You know, um, opposed to just saying, well, you have this symptom, let's just mask it and see where we go from there. And when it gets worse or it evolves into something deeper, then we'll apply some other type of treatment towards it. So, um, and I find that, you know, pretty busy practice. I can only see so many patients. And I think this book will serve not only for potential patients, people that can't come to see me, or existing patients, you know, so we'll kind of give them a guideline. So I can't always be in their ear, you know, um, you know, my current patients, I can't always be in their ear reminding them stuff, you know, they may see me once every three months or whatnot, and I try to refresh their memory. But at least with this, this will be kind of a handbook for them, you know, kind of a do it yourself things to look back at and maybe once they read through it they can bring, come to me after and say well I, I read in your book maybe we should look at this and it'll kind of spark me to look a little bit further so so people can come to you when they're healthy and get this book and get like a head start for people who are proactive but if they have something chronic or, or that would be fatal if left untreated they can start to track down what the root cause is and not just address symptoms, they could start to have an understanding of why this might manifest in their body through their health in a variety Absolutely. of capacities. So in your book, you, you touched on um, the first thing was like food sensitivities and allergies yes. and these sort of things. Yep. So that would be something people would definitely want to take. Like They're behind the eight ball. They already have this happening to them. They're trying to get it triaged and get it under control. How does that information help them in a way that an allopathic doctor is not helping them? Sure. Um so food sensitivities is, is a big topic, and I think it's overlooked by conventional medicine completely. You know, they'll, they'll look for overt food allergies or environmental allergies. Now, we have to differentiate between an allergy and a sensitivity. A food allergy is an almost immediate reaction when you put something into your mouth. Most people that have food allergies will already come to see me explaining, yes, I know I'm allergic to this. If I have it, my throat will close up. I have an EpiPen. And so 
a food allergy, immediate reaction usually affects only three areas of the body, the skin, respiratory tract, or digestive tract. And, you know, pretty easy to figure out, you know. Um, I will run some food allergy testing on people. So, for example, if someone comes in and says, I get hives and I don't have no reason, I have no clue what's causing them. Okay, well, let's maybe it's a food that you're eating and uh, let's check it out. Let's figure it out. But a food sensitivity is a little different. A food sensitivity is more of a delayed or cumulative reaction to a food. So you could eat something in the morning, feel perfectly fine. Five, six hours later, the next day, have some type of reaction. And instead of it affecting just those three areas of the body, it can affect anywhere in the body. It can affect your joints. It can affect your nervous system. Okay, it can cause headaches. It can cause uh, digestive issues. It can cause uh, skin symptoms. And it's more of a cumulative type of thing. You may do it one time and it, you don't see a major reaction. You keep doing it over and over again, then it becomes more cumulative. It's kind of like the load type of thing, you know. So the way I explain it to patients is, um, you know, in our digestive tract, our small intestine, we have a very selective barrier in there between what stays in the digestive tract and what gets absorbed into the bloodstream. Now, when we eat food, we take in food from our diet, proteins in our diet should really be degraded down to their smallest little parts. We shouldn't be absorbing full intact proteins into our bloodstream. When that happens, an immune reaction occurs. Now you're thinking, okay, well, how do these large proteins get into the bloodstream? Well, it's all based on the integrity of our digestive tract. Um, the gut lining. If that lining is a little leaky, we'll call it, and what can cause it to be leaky? Well, you know, eating lots of these sensitive foods, uh, medications, imbalances in your, your, your normal gut flora can cause that gut lining to become a little more leaky. So when you're eating foods over and over again, and certain foods are maybe harder to digest, or you're eating large quantities of certain foods, or other things can creep into the bloodstream, bacteria, toxins, and so forth, your body will mount an immune reaction to it. So you'll see that your body will see these proteins, thinking it's a foreign invader, and start tagging them. The same antibodies that are tagging these proteins can then cross-react and start attacking other areas of the body. In an extreme case, we have autoimmunity. Okay, so in all autoimmune process is pretty much the same. The body doesn't recognize self from non-self. So it's just the names of the diseases that change. So rheumatoid arthritis, your body's attacking your joints. Uh, something like lupus, there's different forms of it. It can, it can affect the kidneys. It can affect the skin in certain instances. Um, in MS, it, it affects the myelin sheath. So all different, um, same process, just different names. And a lot of times, you know, food can be one of those contributing factors. So I think this is crucial. The test is crucial to, to run almost on every patient that comes in to see me because most patients will have some type of inflammatory issue. And we know that inflammation is kind of the root cause of most disease processes. And if you can nip it by identifying the root cause, why not? Whereas in conventional medicine, they may just go strictly towards an anti-inflammatory or just a pain reliever, just kind of working on the, the, the symptom until it kind of progresses. And in a, a worst case scenario, um, let's say the person does get diagnosed officially with an autoimmune disease, typically the treatment of choice would be um, an immunosuppressive drug, okay? So you, they may start off with a steroid, but then it may go a little bit further towards a biologic like um, Humira or something like this that. This is similar to what they're doing for uh, COVID treatment right now, right? The, to prevent the cytokine storm, they're giving people steroid treatments, and that's one of the things that Absolutely. they did for the president. So yeah. it's a similar thing where they're just treating the symptom instead of taking away the situation that's creating that various in symptoms. This, in that, in, with COVID, it's a little different, though, because we're looking more at more of an acute type of process where that's not as bad okay so I, I understand the whole process but you have to take a look like if we're looking at how he was he was treated and I agree with how he was treated wholeheartedly I think they did a really good job and the proof is in the pudding the guy got better within a day or two um, they they took an approach they actually took some degree of a natural approach where they gave him vitamin D zinc they even gave him melatonin because there's good research on that increasing um, uh, interferon levels in the body, interleukins and so forth. Um, they gave him an antacid, um, like a pepsid, which has actually been shown in the research to improve outcomes. 
Um, they put them on uh, an antiviral drug. They put them on the, the, the convalescent plasma drug, the um, Regeneron, I believe the name of it is. And I think that's kind of a unique drug. Um, I think it's kind of goes along with, you know, something that's natural. I mean, you're giving him, he was given um, antibodies from people that already had COVID. So to help his body fight it off. And then on top of all that, to prevent the, the further progression of the cytokine storm, they use dexamethasone, which is a steroid. Now, that's not my first choice of treatment, but I think they did a pretty good job. And, you know, like I said, the proof is in the pudding. The guy's in his 70s. He's a little overweight and came through it pretty well. Um, on my end, I'd probably use some other things to work with the body a little bit more to kind of modulate the immune response a little bit better, opposed to overtly suppressing it and so forth. So, yeah. So people that are coming to you that don't have chronic illness yes you would still start with them a conversation and blood test and people who do have something going on you start with a conversation and in the blood, blood test it's the same same situation irregardless of what you come in and i say this to patients all the time irregardless of what you came in here telling me you can come in here and say listen i'm the healthiest person in america i just want to get worked up i would still do the same thing i'd take a good clinical history on them you know family history and whatnot uh genetic history um, I do a physical exam and then we kind of go through and see, you know, I would have a conversation. What's your diet like? What's your, you know, what's your lifestyle like? And then we would run the appropriate blood work. If the person came in with a laundry list of symptoms, we would do the same exact thing. Um, and then whatever shows up on the lab work and I'd coordinate it with that person's clinical signs and symptoms, then I would come up with a treatment plan. Okay, so if they're, they show up that they're deficient in certain nutrients, there's imbalances of hormones, we find an underlying infection, we find a food sensitivity, we would go right after it. And we would apply a treatment to correct those things. And then we'd see what happens, you know. And usually what, what happens is that laundry list of symptoms gets knocked down. And then we do a, a proper follow-up. So I may see someone initial visit. Two weeks later, they come back and we go over their lab work um, and I put a treatment plan together for them. Then I say, okay, come back in six weeks. We're going to check in, see our progress. And at that point, at six weeks out after being on a treatment plan, I'm expecting to see some degree of improvement, whether it's 10%, 20%. In some cases, it's a slam dunk. You got 90 to 100% improvement. So then at that six week mark, you know, we'll do that evaluation and then we'll push it out another six weeks. And at the additional six weeks, we run blood work again. So we have a before and after picture. What am I, is, are things moving in the right direction? Is anything new cropping up here? And then we obviously have a conversation. And I find that this is the best way to kind of do it. And this is kind of how I laid out the book. I kind of broke it down for patients in terms of or people reading the book, readers. Um, it's all based upon my model of how I present with, with my patients, how I present it to them. What type of uh, blood tests do you run on them but that, that would be different than an allopathic doctor? Because a lot of people say, I went to the doctor, they did some blood tests, they gave me an antibiotic or they gave me an antiviral. Yeah. What's the nature of yours? Because it's not just nutrition, you're also checking for other things. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I'm obviously, I'm doing... Along the same lines of what they're doing, I'm, yes, I'm going to look for overt pathology and disease, always. Um, but at the same time, I'm looking more for those gray areas, okay? Um, so one of the big things, the, the first test that I kind of like to look at is how the person is metabolizing their sugar, carbohydrates, and starches in their diet. A lot of doctors don't look at this. They'll run a lipid panel, cholesterol panel. But I look a little bit deeper when it comes to that. Um, one of the biggest tests that I look at to kind of get a good idea of that person's diet and lifestyles, I look at a marker called a triglyceride. It's a simple test. A triglyceride's a fat in your blood. That's what it is. And the reason why I like looking at this test first and foremost is that it gives me an idea of the person's dietary habits. If the triglyceride levels show up extremely high, you know, in my opinion, anything above 100 is high. Um, it tells me that that person's taking in much more sugar, carbohydrates, or starches than what their body can utilize. And so if I see that, num so then I go through, obviously, through their whole diet and kind of pick it apart a little bit. 
between their first visit and second visit, I actually have them do a little homework for me. And I kind of go through this in the book, which is which is interesting, is that I have them monitor on a daily basis their total amount of carbohydrates. I say, well, how do I do that? I say, it's the simplest thing in the world. Whatever you put in your mouth, if it comes from a box, a bag, a can, or a jar, you flip it over, you read where it says total carbohydrates, and you make a mental note or jot it down. If you're eating something that does not have a label on it, you pick up your phone and ask your phone, you know, how many carbohydrates are there in a banana, you know? And so you kind of go from there. And I like to get that number because let's say, for example, the person comes back after two weeks, we're going to go over their blood work. And the first thing I look at is those triglyceride numbers. And I see the triglyceride number at 300 and it should be less than 100. I say, okay, well, how many carbohydrates are you consuming? Oh, I... I'm eating around 500 grams of carbohydrates. Okay, well, that's a little too much, okay? So from there, we're going to modify your diet. You know, in depending upon what else I see, you know, there's all levels to where I'm gonna go with this person. And I think from a dietary perspective, the amount of carbohydrates that one a person's consuming on a daily basis really is, is defining. It, it can kind of get them moving in the right direction and get them to a level of better health. Because I find that that particular number itself, knowing those carbohydrates, if you're going excess, that can lead to all these other problems, heart disease, diabetes, inflammation, obesity. I mean, so if we can scale back on the, the those carbohydrates in the diet, and maybe we introduce some more good fats and proteins into the diet, the person's on their way. And I see it very, very quickly, a change within the three-month period of time. And so everyone has, I feel, a sweet spot. Everyone has their own carbohydrate tolerance level, okay? And it's based on a bunch of different things. It's based upon your genetic predisposition. If someone has a family history of diabetes, you know, mom has it, dad has it, grandma has it, their ability to metabolize carbohydrates, starches, and sugar is going to be a heck of a lot less than someone that does not have a family history. And so I take that into consideration. I take into consideration their activity level. If someone's sitting behind a desk all day, their ability to metabolize fuel, carbohydrates in this sense, is going to be much less than someone that's working construction. So their level of intake of carbs is going to be significantly less. And therefore, you know, so we have to figure that out. So that's why I like to kind of have people do that little bit of homework, go home, okay, figure out what's, what's your, where are you at right now? Don't change your diet at all from what you're doing, doing currently. We'll talk about that later, but where are you at? So if they're, you know, if their triglycerides are here, okay, it's this many carbs are causing your triglycerides to be here. How much do we have to adjust that? You know, and obviously, you know, once we adjust it, we start noticing, oh, the person's losing weight. They're not having big fluctuations in their blood sugar. They're not crashing and burning middle of the day. And this can compound into other things. So when we have poor um, blood sugar management, that impacts our ability to focus and concentrate. I see this with kids all the time. You know, kids are riddled with, you know, they're eating way too many carbohydrates, like off the charts. I know they're active, they're running around, but at the same time, when I start running blood work on, you know, a 10-year-old or a 7-year-old, and I see triglycerides above 100, there's a problem there. There's a big, big problem. It means that this kid's sitting in front of the, the computer, you know, playing video games too much, not getting outside, or just massively over-consuming. And that's what we're seeing today. And so this book can translate not just to adults, but also children. So it's a way for parents to kind of take their children's health into their own hands, okay? Um, because a lot of times you're not getting any of this information from your conventional doctor. You know, when was the last time your conventional doctor actually sat down with you and talked about your diet? It's, it's, it's non-existent because first of all, they don't have the time to spend. And second of all, they have no training in that. It's unfortunate, you know, they don't have training, you know, any bit of training in nutrition, maybe an hour out of their whole career. And it's very rudimentary. It's not clinical nutrition where we're actually using diet and lifestyle and, and, and nutrition to cure disease, not just patch someone up, you know, so. Yeah, I don't think a lot of people realize that, that doctors, allopathic doctors at hospitals get 
like during med school they get like an hour at best i've heard a day yeah it's not a lot and it's it's pretty it's kind of mainstream type of nutrition too like rda type of stuff um you know i i see it all the time where a diabetic for example will get sent to a registered dietitian um who is more along the lines of conventional nutrition and you know instead of educating that diabetic on the amount of carbohydrates and so forth they're they're put into this antiquated model of looking at you know the amount of fats that they're eating i mean fat is hugely demonized you know and it's starting to people are starting to realize that fat's not the culprit that it is more the sugar carbohydrates and starches and so i see you know all the time so getting back to the whole carbohydrate thing so how do triglycerides scale with the blood sugar? So if you take in more carbs than what your body can burn, those excess carbs go to your liver, and your liver actually transforms the sugar, the glucose, over to a triglyceride. And you can either burn that triglyceride as a fuel source or you store it directly as body fat. Okay, So that's the whole process of there, uh, how that works. But also that excess carbohydrate can also be converted over to cholesterol. Okay, So... That's another, you know, topic. You know, most doctors consider a patient healthy solely based upon their cholesterol reading. That's just one marker, and cholesterol actually is is not really a great predictor for cardiovascular disease by itself. It's not really a good independent risk factor. You have to look at all the big picture here. You have to look at the quality of the cholesterol. Cholesterol is not the demon. Okay, we need cholesterol. Every cell membrane in our body requires cholesterol in that cell membrane. We need cholesterol to make all of our hormones, brain chemicals, and so forth. 25% of the cholesterol in our blood goes directly to our brain. Uh, people don't realize that. I get people coming in on cholesterol drugs, and I'm like, "You have your cholesterol is like practically zero. How are you even functioning? Well, I don't feel that great. But my doctor says that I'm at a high risk for cardiovascular disease, so I need to be on lots of, you know, It's like they're drying drugs. up their brain. Their brain's made out it's, of fat. You're exactly right. People don't really realize that. Um, and to make hormones, I mean, one of the biggest things that I see is, you know, I'll see a postmenopausal woman come in to see me, and her, she says, you know, I said, what are you here for? Um, well, ever since menopause, my cholesterol level has shot up, and my, my doctor's concerned about it. I said, okay. Well, there's a reason why your cholesterol went up after menopause is because the cholesterol that was once being utilized by the ovaries to produce hormones, ovaries are not working now. So now we still have, you know, this cholesterol kind of hanging around. One of the things that I do to kind of modulate that in certain patients is we work on balancing out those hormones and the, the cholesterol levels a lot of times will go down. And a lot of times you have to take a look at the quality of the cholesterol that's 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 being made in the body. Is it the HDL cholesterol that's sent from the liver out to the tissues to pick up the unusable cholesterol and bring it back, or is it the LDL cholesterol that's made in the tissue, made in the, the liver and sent out to the tissues? And what's the quality of it? Are they small, little, dense particles that are more likely to become damaged or oxidized and get lodged in the artery wall? Are they large, buoyant particles of cholesterol that we find more from eating quality cholesterol-based foods in our diet? So. That's a differentiation that needs to be done. It's not a one-size-fits-all. I, I see it way too often where doctors are just simply looking at this total cholesterol number and saying, okay, we got to get that below 200. Well, let's look at the big picture. So that takes me to my next marker that I look at is actually your total to HDL ratio, which is the total cholesterol divided by your HDL cholesterol. And I like to see that number below 3.5. So if it's below 3.5, I don't care if your total cholesterol is 400. If you're offsetting it with the HDL cholesterol, which is going to go out and pick up unused cholesterol and bring it back to the liver to be recirculated, we're good to go. The next thing that I look at from a cardiovascular standpoint, from a wellness standpoint, is obviously inflammation. We talked a little bit about that. If the person is completely inflamed, we have to f look a little bit further. What's the etiology behind it? What's driving this inflammatory process in the body? And the one that I, the one test that I do look look at is called a, a C-reactive protein. I look at a highly sensitive one, which kind of um, identifies inflammation kind of centered around the cardiovascular system. So then we kind of modify from there. And then I, I look a little bit further. We look at omega-3 intake in the diet. We can do that through conventional testing. And these are all, by the way, these are all tests that can be run through your local laboratory. 
Okay. It's just a matter of your doctor wanting to run it, you know, and having the ability to interpret it. So the whole point of my book is, okay, well, if your doctor's not going to do this for you, well, here's a, here's a site. I give people a site where they can actually go and purchase their own lab work at actually 90% off the retail price. And then once they get that information, they can look back into my book and say, okay, these are Dr. Ada's ideal reference ranges. And okay, and so I, this is what's kind of going on with me. And based upon where, what my clinical symptoms are, what my needs are, and here's the treatment, you know? And so I, I provide, you know, what I would do from a treatment standpoint. Maybe you need this vitamin, maybe you need this, maybe you need this supplement. So we kind of walk the person through it and at least it gets them moving in the right direction so they can start taking back their health. You know, and the the subtitle of my book is uh, you know it's a taking back your health through individualized wellness based naturopathic medicine. So individualized, no one size fits all, wellness based, not disease based. So we're looking to get you optimal health, not just patch you up, not just solely look for disease. So I think it's uh, I think it's it's of definite value. Well, it's timely. It's it, and it makes sense. And it's not out there in many other forms. It's it's hard to find a good naturopathic physician, and to be able to go to a regular physician and get this type of service is almost impossible. So essentially, the blood is telling the story of what we're putting in our mouths and what kind of things we're doing with our bodies. Yep. And then you're taking those scientific outputs from testing, and you're helping to form a diet. Yeah. And so, one of the big things, you know, there's when I'm talking to patients about diet, I, I broke it down into a kind of a three-tiered system. And it's based upon the amount of carbohydrates that that person should be consuming on, a, on an average on a daily basis. So if the person is, uh, you know, a diabetic, they need to lose 50 pounds, you know, if, you know, they have a lot going on, their triglycerides are off the charts, they got lots of inflammation. Then we kind of push them into uh, a, a range where I want to keep their total number of carbohydrates per day around 50 grams or less, okay? Kind of in a tighter range, almost into like a ketogenic type of state because we want to, you know, we really want to get their body to utilize any of these stored carbs and kind of adapt their metabolism to start burning dietary fat and body fat as their primary fuel opposed to just relying solely on carbohydrates, starches and sugar. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's tier one. And then we kind of go from there. If the person is only needs to lose about five, 10 pounds, you know, their triglycerides are just slightly out of range. Their blood sugar is so, so then we shoot more for a sweet spot of like 50 to 75 grams. And obviously we can modify this as we go along. And then um, from there, we can go up a little bit. So we have these different levels in regards to their carbohydrate intake. And I find that just following this type of model has been fantastic for my patients. And it's simple. You know, it's just them being more cognizant of what they're putting in their body. You know, they're, they're actually reading labels. They're not just eating blindly. So, for example, like I'll have a patient that I had a patient come in to see me who... Um, was was consuming you know for breakfast you know a bowl of oatmeal every morning glass of juice and then kind of going from there a sandwich for lunch you know typical diet and i ran the blood work triglycerides were off the charts upwards of around 300 cholesterol was out of control blood sugar wasn't that great inflammation was high so the first thing i said is okay well let's see how many carbohydrates i go let's i'll break it down for you so I said, the easiest way to do it is this. I pick up my phone. I ask my phone, how many carbohydrates are there in a cup of uncooked oats? 65 grams of carbohydrates. So that's a lot. Granted, you know, in our blood fasting, okay, when we, in a, a non-diabetic individual, we only have about five grams of sugar coursing through our entire body. That's one teaspoon, Okay. Now you eat your first meal of the day and it's, you know, 60 to 65 grams of carbohydrates just in that bowl of oatmeal. Now, what are you going to add to it? Oh, I'm going to add some honey to it. I'm going to put some raisins in there. We're going to do a glass of juice. The glass of juice is another 40 grams of carbohydrates. So I'm telling this patient, okay, you should be eating 50 grams of carbohydrates or less per day. 
on an average, you just you just blew three days worth of carbohydrates in one particular meal. Grant, if if the person's going to run marathons, if they're you know they're they're exercising or what, they can get away with a little bit more. But when you take in more than what your body can use, it's excess. It's completely excess. Now, people always say, well, what about you know counting your fat? in counting your protein. What about that? Doesn't aren't those calories don't the calories of fat add up more isn't that the whole premise of weight watchers where we you know we cut out the cut out the fats cuz fats are more points. Well, the unique thing about fat and I I like I talk about this pretty extensively in the book is when we eat fat in the absence of carbohydrates, okay? When we kind of restrict carbs and eat more dietary fat in replacement of the carbs. The amount of fat, fat is more self-limiting. Mm-hmm. You know, how many sticks of butter are you going to eat? How many avocados can you eat? It's, you know, it's self-limiting. And so you're never going to over, really over-consume dietary fat. And the beauty of, of dietary fat in, in the body, is in, in your diet, is that it serves as a building block to many different things. We talked about you need, you need fats to you know, make hormones. You need fats to replenish the nervous system. So there's a lot of structural components that go into, um, you know, that your body will use dietary fat for, unlike carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, there's no structural value. You don't make anything from carbohydrates. The only thing that you ultimately will make from carbohydrates is body fat, okay? So it's like rocket fuels. You burn what you can. Some get stored in your liver, your kidneys, your muscles to be used later as something called glycogen, a quick energy source. Um, but the rest, if you don't utilize it, you don't burn it, it just gets sent to your liver and it gets turned into body fat in the form of a triglyceride. So um, protein is similar to fat. It's primarily used for structural components. When we're in a pinch, we can kind of metabolize protein over to carbohydrates and burn it. But you know, we don't want to rely on protein as a fuel source. Now, that's one of the issues that I have with a lot of diets that are out, that are out there that are like, you know, a low carb, high protein, low fat diet. That's a recipe for disaster because now you're relying on protein as your fuel source, okay? Now, protein, yes, like I said, you can use protein as a fuel, but it's a dirty fuel. It increases a lot of nitrogen, urea, nitrogen, creatinine levels. And that that's puts a burden on on the on the body and puts a burden on your kidneys and things like that. So, um my diet that I promote towards patients is more of obviously a, a lower or managed carb diet, depending upon you as an individual. Not everyone's going to be a ketogenic diet, you know, somewhere in between there. Um, and it's a moderate protein diet and ha- actually higher in good fats, you know, beneficial fats. We're not eating stuff from a fry later. Um, you know, eating the whole egg, uh, wild caught fish, grass fed meats avocados, you know, coconut oil, olive oil, nuts and seeds. So these are just some examples of, of good quality fats in the diet, you know, so they're, they're a necessity. So fat's a fuel. Most people are using sugar and carbs exactly. as their fuel. And the oatmeal thing, man, like how do we get brought up? What, what box of cereal did you eat before you went to school oh, every day time. as a kid, big man? Time. Like that's how we're trained, right? That's, that's exactly how we're trained. So we can learn it for ourselves and improve the lives of our children and Absolutely. not pass it on to another and generation. And the big thing is this. You, it's not like you can never have oatmeal. Okay, so the patient that came in that's eating a, a cup of uncooked oats, you know, you know it's, it's a cup of uncooked oats, before, obviously, before you cook it. And uh, I said, let's do this instead. Let's do a quarter cup of oats and let's crack a couple eggs. We'll mix it in there, you know, um, and we'll cook all that up. Now you went from 60 grams of carbohydrates down to 15 grams of carbohydrates. Big difference. Then you add the fats in there, maybe add a little bit of butter or something like that, maybe some coconut flakes, some nuts, some seeds, whatever you want to add to it. So now you're getting some substance and you, you go from a nutrient void type of meal towards a more nutrient dense meal where you're introducing more of the fats and the proteins into this meal. And that's one of the key key components that I kind of educate people on. We're not, it's not, I'm not trying to put you in a bubble and have you eat, you know, just one way. Everyone has, it's just about moderation and we have to figure out where we need to go. And everyone's an individual. And as you get healthier, we get a little bit more leeway there. Okay, yeah, we can up your carbs. Yeah, you're much more active. So it's just that, I will know. I can see it right on the blood work. 
um, and I can see it in the person's clinical signs and symptoms, when you're exceeding what your body can utilize. That's the key thing. So, you know, I consider, you know, when we're looking at fat in the diet, when we're eating more fats and limiting the carbs, we're, we're, we're kind of priming the body to utilize stored body fat, which is like logs on the wood pile. Okay, and we're throwing those logs into the fire and we're burning that and we're keeping our metabolism going all day long. And I use the analogy that, you know, carbohydrates in our diet is like eating stick is like sticks, twigs and paper getting thrown on this metabolic fire burns very quickly and it goes out, burns very quickly and it goes out. So we're constantly a slave to consuming these carbohydrates to keep our fire going. Okay. Otherwise it goes out and then we crash, crash and burn. And what do we do? We go looking for more, you know? So that's the key component. And like I said, I wrote a book about five years ago, it was more geared towards weight loss. And it was a little bit more stringent in regards to the dietary recommendations. And people did really great with it, but I think it's not for everyone. You know, it's it's for a select group of people that are really geared towards really getting their weight down. This book is a little different. Yes, it's it's geared towards diet and obviously, uh, uh, you know, achieving a, a good weight for yourself, but it's more than that. It's more about overall health and wellness. The first book was fantastic. We did great with it. People liked it. It's just uh, I, I moved a little bit away from the strictness of a sheer you know, keto type of diet more to something that is, you know, well-rounded. In this in this book, I still talk about more of the keto component of it, but I'm not having people test for ketones. I'm not having people track as as, as often. And so it's, it's a little bit more user-friendly. Um, and I found that it was a little bit easier to kind of convey that to patients in my, in my practice. Yeah. So it's an adjustment process. Like absolutely, the blood test is a finite thing. It takes a couple of weeks. Then it's the conversation with you to see what they have to change, and then they change it slowly over time. And then you come back after six weeks or another six weeks, and then you're not seeing all the change that you want to see because maybe some of the things they need are not in their diet. Let's talk about supplements then. Yeah. So with dietary supplements, um, you know, I find there's a definite need for them. Does does everyone need to be on supplements? I think everyone should be on certain dietary supplements just because there's certain uh, nutrients that are lacking in the food supply. So I'll give you a quick example. Uh, vitamin D, for example, okay? Um, not everyone's, you know, is able to achieve a level of vitamin D solely through their diet. We get vitamin D a lot from the sun, okay? As our, you know, the sun hits our skin, our body metabolizes cholesterol over to vitamin D. And so a lot of us don't get enough sun. So it's just logical that we need to supplement with that vitamin D. So that's one thing that I, one nutrient that I recommend to almost every patient that I see. Another nutrient that I find to be, even in a well-rounded diet, is, is magnesium. I find that the food supply is, is pretty void in magnesium. Magnesium is super important. It's involved in like over 300 enzymatic processes in the body. So pretty important for your body to function at full capability. And so, um, you know, there's, we can get it in our diet, but once again, nutrient density, you know, the food today is not the same as it was 50, 100 years ago. You know, um, you know, we have food, we eat a lot of food that's out of season. You know, um, a lot of times food is, is ripened on a truck as it's coming to the, the, the grocery store. So, you know, by the time we get it, the nutrient density is not there. Even if you're eating organic foods and, and so forth, um, you know, the best of the best, you're still you're still coming up a little short. And I saw that with myself, you know, when I've run nutrient profiles on myself, I feel that I eat a pretty well-rounded diet. I think I get, I try to consume the best quality foods out there. And I, I still came up shy in a bunch of different nutrients. So I have to, you know, take some dietary supplements. And, you know, the the amount of supplements that a person needs to take is gear, is, is them as an individual. And it's all hinges upon what their, their needs are. And initially, maybe they're on a, a bunch of stuff because we're trying to work them out of the gutter, you know, work them out of a hole. And then as they start to eat better and start to, you know, manage their health a little bit better, their list of supplements goes down, goes down, goes down, goes down, you know, until they're on just a, a handful of things. People ask me all the time, what do you take on a daily basis? I take a general multivitamin. I take some fish oil. I take some magnesium. 
I take a probiotic because I'm not always getting good uh, fermented foods in my diet, even though I try to. And I take some fish oil. And that's it. That's kind of like my daily thing. Now, do I take other things besides it? Yes, I do. And it's all, ba- but it's rotational, depending upon what's going on. If I feel like I'm coming down with something, I'll kick up the zinc. I'll do maybe some other nutrients. If I'm a little achy, maybe I'll throw in some curcumin or turmeric uh, as an anti-inflammatory. So I, or I'm having some issues with sleep. Maybe I'll throw a little CBD into the mix to sleep at night. So there's, I'm always constantly shuffling things around. But my core are those particular nutrients that I just kind of outlined. And I talk about that in the book. I say, you know, listen, these are my core four or five supplements that I, I recommend for everyone. And then kind of branch off from there, you know. So... Um, you know, the healthier you are, the less supplements you kind of need, you know? Well, I think the other thing is uh, the quality control on a lot of supplements is not there at all. And then people don't know when and how to take the supplements as far as being fat soluble or Absolutely. with or without meals. And they don't understand that. So they're taking things and they're spending a lot of money, yep. but it's not effective. So can you explain quality assurance? Absolutely. Yeah. So all the products that I use in my practice, I, I source... Uh, Myself and a colleague, we source all the raw material. We independently lab test everything that, that gets put out there to, to patients. And we use uh, GMP standards for everything. We use uh, you know FDA-approved uh, uh, facilities to, mm-hmm. to that get checked by the FDA, make sure they're following all the guidelines. And so all the products that I, I utilize, they're, not, they're all private labeled. Um, they're in my label. And I formulated them. I came up with the with the product, um, with the ingredients. I, I put the formulation together through a lot of trial and error with a lot of different things, trying them out with different patients. And we scrapped a couple things and we kind of go back or if we, we, and we try to find the best quality nutrients. We're constantly updating those things. And so when you just, when I just say to a patient, okay, well you need vitamin D. Okay, no problem, I'll just go to CVS and grab it, okay. That's one way to do it, but I can't really vouch for the quality of what you're going to get at a drugstore. They put a lot of fillers in there. Um, a lot. The problem with a lot of the supplements on the market, it's a it's a it's a, a different thing, you know, where they're not scrutinized as much as a drug is. Now, the products that I use, we scrutinize them just like as if they are a drug because I'm using them with patients that it's make or break. You know, I'm not going to give someone something that's tainted. Okay, that has this much lead or mercury or whatever in it or PCBs, you know, I want to, I want quality. And so, cause I'm, if I'm working with a cancer patient, I don't want to make them sicker. I want to make them healthier. Um, so certain vitamins, yeah, you have to know how to dose them. You know, most people just go into a health food store or a grocery store or CVS and they look at the label. Oh, take one a day. Okay, perfect. Well, one a day may not be cutting the mustard for you as an individual. It's better than taking nothing, or they may take too much. Maybe they, they maybe they don't need as much of that. It was interesting. I had a patient come to see me. This was an interesting case. Her primary complaint was that she was having a lot of bowel issues, digestive issues, chronic diarrhea all the time for the past four to five years. The first thing I did was I said, okay, what supplements are you currently taking? She was taking a lot. Of, she's like, I don't take any medications. I take a lot of supplements. So the first thing I look at was the quality of the product she was taking, and she brought all her bottles, which was fantastic. I looked at the back, and I said, this product right here is giving you your chronic diarrhea. She goes, how could that be? I said, this is a magnesium product. You're taking, this is the poorest form of magnesium. It's called magnesium oxide. I do use it in my practice. You know who I use it with? People that are constipated. I said, you're not constipating. You're taking this every single day, and you're getting loose stools. I said, I'm going to cure your diarrhea. You're going to stop taking this product. So she, she did. She came back after a week and she goes, wow, I'm not having diarrhea anymore. I said, okay, well, let's, what else is going on? So, you know, so that's one case. You know, I've had patients who um, came in with uh, neuropathies in their hands and I look at the supplements. I said, well, you're taking, a, you're taking massive amounts of B6. I said, why are you doing that? Well, I heard that it's good for, you know, neuropathy. I said, well, the form you're taking, unless, you know, genetically, if you have a hard time metabolizing that, it can build up in your nerves and actually exacerbate your neuropathy, the numbness and tingling in the hands. I said, we're going to switch you off of that. And we're going to put you on an activated form of B6 called P5P and see how you do. Lo and behold, numbness and tingling goes away. So, you know, 
I like that people try to take their health into their own hands, but they need proper guidance. And, you know, they're not going to get that from your conventional doctor. You know, you, 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 you ask a doctor about a supplement, they, they go blank. They don't, they don't know what to answer unless they're, unless they're into it, you know, unless they've been trained formally in, in vitamins and nutrients and herbs and things like that. Most conventional MDs are not going to have an answer for you. So that's where I come into play. That's where my book comes into play because it will educate you. So I go through in the book, I go through majority of the nutrients that are essential to check for. And that should be supplement. And I talk about the reference ranges and I tip about, talk about the specific dosing, the quality of it. Because, you know, one size does not fit all. You know, you can get, you can buy a magnesium product for $2, a bottle of a thousand <laughs> pills, you know, at Costco. Or you can buy a quality product for $40 and it's, you know, a, a month's supply. Big difference in terms of the quality control. One's like just eating, you know, you know, eating rocks. The other one is a, a good quality that you're going to absolutely absorb. You know, so that's that's crucial, and that's what I try and educate people on with you know with what what we're talking about in the book. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing is that people try to skimp on health and they think they're saving money, absolutely. but it's like you're internalizing these things and trying to make them part of your body. And if they're not yep. the right uh, formulation to be able to bond and internalize, you're either just wasting it or you're having it build up in your body to find out later. Hundred percent. No, that's that's an awesome point. Yeah, I mean, because I'm seeing, yeah, you, you nailed it. You know, because that's what we're seeing is that people are, you know, they're either going too hardcore in one direction or they're not doing anything at all because they're overwhelmed by it. You know, I, I have patients come in all the time. And they say, you know, I want to take some supplements, but I'm I walk into the the store and I'm like overwhelmed. There's a thousand bottles here, and I'm not going to just ask the guy that's working there because he's going to try and push every everything on the on the shelf to me. So people tend to say, okay, well, I'm not, or then you have the opposite <laughs> where people come in with a crate, you know, of all their supplements and they drop it on my desk and say, I'm taking all this. I say, why? And they say, well, I heard this is good for this and this is good for this. And I say, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to run some lab work. I'm going to listen to you. What are your complaints, your concerns? You may need just, you know, a fraction of these things. I just had a guy the other day, same thing. He actually went to a colleague of mine who didn't run any blood work and just went by sheer clinical signs and symptoms, loaded this guy up with tons of supplements. I said, okay, well, let's, maybe you need some of these. I don't know. We're going to find out. I'm not going to, I'm, I can't see into your body, but what we'll do is we'll run the blood work. We run it. I said, you need, you don't need to be on any of these things. I said, you need to be on like these three things. That's it. And what was interesting about this, this case was, um, he was on a lot of anti-inflammatory type of products, a lot of different herbs that were fantastic herbs and, and nutrients, the best quality for pain and inflammation in his joints and his muscles. I said, and at the time we also ran a food test, a food sensitivity test. So I said, you know what? You don't need any of these anti-inflammatories. He goes, well, why not? I'm, I'm inflamed. I said, well, all you gotta do is stop eating these foods that we identified and your inflammation will go away and you won't need all these things. He's like, oh my God. You know, it's, it, in, in fact, one of the cool, one of the interesting things was he tested positive he, his, on his food test. On the food test, we test for spices and we test for, you know, food additives. And at the top of his list was curcumin or turmeric, the spice turmeric. This guy's taken three different types of turmeric products prescribed by another doctor. I said, well, in, in theory, it makes sense. Okay, you're going to take this 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 turmeric and it's anti-inflammatory, but in your body, it's inflammatory. It's like, oh my God, you know. Then the other thing was, the other doctor had him using uh, whey protein, you know, whey protein shakes every morning. The guy had a severe dairy sensitivity. I said, well, I go, that's the value in putting the money into doing the testing opposed to just throwing money at a, a wider, a shotgun approach individualized right individualized medicine and so that's the big differentiation so that's how i differentiate myself not only from conventional doctors but also other people in my field you know because their intentions are there you know they're good intentions to get the person better but if you're not looking past your nose you're it's like you're fitting everyone into this this one one dimensional model here you know and so a natural doctor could be just, you know, doing the same thing as a conventional doctor, but just using 
herbs and nutrients opposed to drugs. And there's really no, I mean, yeah, using the herbs and nutrients is better than using the drugs in the long run, but there's no real differentiation in terms of how you're getting this person better. You're really not. You're just masking. So it seems like there's situations where people have scarcity mindset that drives them to buy lesser quality supplements, but buy in a wider variety because they don't stop and get an expert's opinion. Now they're trying to shotgun and and then they're creating problems that aren't even the ones they started out with. And then yep. they're just making it harder for you to undo that sort Absolutely. of thing. Yeah. And that was, that was, that was the, that was the stimulus for me to write this book, you know, exactly what you said. It's cause you know, I can't, I can reach a fair, a pretty good audience of people that come to see me and when I do talks and things like that. But this, this is on a wide scale. If this, if I could get this book out to everyone, if every conventional doctor said, here, read Dr. Aida's book and see what you think. I think we would minimize the amount of chronic illness that we have in this country by substantial amounts, you know, I mean, but the drug companies wouldn't like that. <laughs> I was going to say, that's a good goal. I don't know how realistic it is, but it is realistic for someone to pick up the book because it's an easy read. It's not very easy. It's not 5,000 pages. Oh, it's it's like, very concise. It's like 50 pages with a lot of just reference stuff, you know? So um, it's not hard reading, you know? And I'll come out with an audio book to make it really easy. Yeah, take people. away their excuses. <laughs> and then uh, this also keeps you, when you internalize a new patient, when you bring somebody on, onboard them for your process. You don't have to remember to say all the things because when exactly. you're doing that repetitively, it's just better to have a handbook that well, they can reference on their own time. That's exactly right. That was another um, reason for doing this. You know, it's like, okay, I keep having to say the same thing over and over again. It's, it's interesting because I have patients that I've been seeing for 10, 15, close to 20 years. And they may come back and see me once a year and we run our annual blood work. And I have some patients that were saying the same, I'm saying the same thing over and over again. And I'm, I'm, you know, and now it's like, okay, I'm not, your blood work doesn't look that great. So, you know, instead of going through the whole spiel again, read the book and you come back and when you're ready, you know, so it's, it's hard, you know, people forget you get, it's, it's easy to go back to that comfortable mindset of, you know, what you were doing initially. You know, so I'll have a patient will go through and explain the whole carbohydrate thing. You need to scale back on this. I see him six months later, a year later. What are you eating for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? It's the same exact thing that they told me the day one that they came in here, came in to see me. Oh, I'm eating my big bowl of oatmeal. I'm eating, you know, it's like, okay, well, didn't we talk about that? And that's why this looks like this. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Well, I like it, you know, so I gravitated back towards it. And I heard that it's good for your your cholesterol to eat a lot of oatmeal. I said, we debunked that a long time ago, but I'll talk about it again. So it is it is that repetitive nature. And some people need to hear it over and over again. But when it's not sinking in, it's like, okay, just I think now what I'm going to do with most of my patients is your homework is every six months <laughs> you read my book and then come in and see me. So reread it the night before. So you could probably bang it out in, a, in an hour. Come back and see me and then make it a little easier. And, and it will stick, I think. I think it'll stick a little bit better when they're constantly being exposed. Because listen, I need to hear stuff over. You know, a lot of times, you know, I forget to practice what I preach. It's, it's, it's easy to fall off track. So you need someone keeping you accountable. You know, it's, uh, but if you have this as a resource, at least you you can say, I, I have this, you know? Well, and the accountability aspect, that's something that challenges people in that's every, the hardest part every of my profession. Job. Yeah, yeah. So maybe you should partner up with somebody that's like a lifestyle optimization accountability yeah. partner, or you could create like an email sequence that every week or so touches base with people well, gonna, that have that. We're going to try set. We're going to do that with the book. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm toying with when a person buys the book, it's an ebook, they download it and then they get thrown into uh, a weekly email thing just to kind of keep them. Okay. So you're a week into your, your diet plan. Have you gotten your blood work done yet? Have you done this yet? And that's kind of similar to what I did with my first book. So I'm going to kind of, and it was successful. So I'm going to carry that into this book so that when, you know, yeah, just to keep people on, on track and people need those reminders without being a pain, without saying, okay, I'm watching you, <laughs> you know, so. So bringing it all full circle, what's the comparison and contrast? Uh, people can internalize this information. They don't internalize this information. What would be the benefit to go through the rigors of changing habits and after reading the book, yeah. implementing it? Because that's where it comes from. You can read the book, but if you don't implement You're it, exactly it doesn't do right. any You can good. download it and keep it on your hard drive, and it could just sit there for the rest of your life but never really utilize it. Um, it's 
it, and everyone is on their different on a different timeline. You know, I get patients who may come to see me initially. We uh, we follow up, you know, a couple weeks later, and then they kind of fall off the map, you know. And then they may come back a year later and say, "Okay, I'm ready." So a lot of a big part of it is is people have to be ready to make those changes. And and everyone's on, like I said, everyone's on a different timeline. And so at least they know they can fall back on this, that they have this book. Okay, I'm gonna now is the time for me, and I'm gonna do this. And I make it really simple, and I make it usable, so it's not like a and, and you can you can edge you can ease your way into it too, you know. Let's say the person really should be doing you know 50 grams of carbs or less. They should be doing this, doing this, doing this. Well, they're not ready for that. That may be too overwhelming. So we'll say, all right, count up how many carbs you're doing in a day. Okay, is it 200? Let's shoot for 150. Let's shoot for 125, and let's start tapering it down. And once you get accustomed to it, and I kind of walk people through that in the book. Um, then we start moving, we start graduating and setting little goals for yourself. And I, I talk about these, you know, goal setting throughout the book because like I said everyone is on their own timeline. Not everyone's gonna some people will jump head first into it and wanna, you know, change their whole lifestyle and everything overnight. Other people, they they're not they're not that ambitious, okay? Or they have other things going on and this is not on the top of their priority list. Unfortunately, one of the the stimulus for people to 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 do these things to you know to a T is when they get into trouble from a health standpoint and sometimes it takes it you know it takes some a scare for them to to jump in oh you know i my i had some issues with my heart or i'm getting this symptom or that symptom i ended up in the hospital for this i need to make some changes okay well here you go here's the here's the blueprint you know to do that and so that's that's one of the biggest hurdles that I have, you know, even with patients that come to see me. They're all gung ho initially, they do it, they do it for a period of time and then they fall off track. But ultimately my thing is this, you know, I everyone falls off track. But I in my practice, I make sure that people come back on a regular basis so they get kind of tuned up and get back into the game. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Uh, everyone goes off track. It's about realizing what does off track look like yeah. and how do I get back on track? Exactly. And, and, and one of the things that I, did fi- I do find that when patients are working with me is that, you know, when they do go off track, they kind of have my voice in the back of their head saying, OK, you know, when, when you're going to when you're going to kind of get back into the groove of things. And so, um, you know, they will fall off track, but they won't fly way off like, you know, crazy. They'll just they'll deviate slightly because they know. I'm going to go see Dr. Eden in like six months, and I know he's going to give me hell if my blood work, my triglycerides are to the moon and the cholesterol and my blood sugar and everything else. So they may deviate slightly, but they know that something's coming up. They got to get their blood work. So they tighten up a little bit. So that in itself is, is, is helpful for people. Yeah. The idea of supplements, it sounds like a good idea, but people are a little more on guard these days because of uh, importing ingredients and things going on with the COVID situation. And you talked about quality assurance. Um, Most uh, everything that you make is made in the United States, but you do have to source some ingredients because they're indigenous to other countries. Absolutely. Yeah. How's that work? So, yeah, everything is 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 made here in the United States. It's it's bottled. It's it's encapsulated. It's bottled here in the, in the United States at a couple different places. And we try to obviously source locally if we can, you know, local to, um, you know, but a lot of herbs, nutrients, we do get from overseas, from different countries. Um, certain herbs grow only in certain environments. So, but when, when, when they do come in, we quality control test them, you know, and we'll send stuff back. I mean, if there's any type of discrepancy there, we will we will deny it, and we don't we don't use it, obviously. And so it's really really strict quality control that I use with every single product that I have. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds really expensive, and it sounds like it a is. corner that other people yeah. would probably cut. I mean, if you're Costco, you're right. And your customers aren't savvy. No, you're probably right. going to have some extra fillers in there. No, you're exactly right. I mean, you can, you can, that's like I talked about earlier, you know, you can have a, a product that is, you know, a dollar a bottle or $10 a bottle. Big differentiation between it. You know, one can be loaded with binders and fillers and not the greatest quality where you're going to get something that is optimal. And the beauty of it is it's going to actually work. You know, that's, that's the key thing. My reputation hinges upon me getting people better. 
And if I give them garbage, they're not going to get better and they're not going to come see me. So I have to ha use the best quality, everything. And so, um, you know, and I can't say that for everyone that's that's out there in the market. You know, there's if you just go, like, you know, even if even if you go to a health food store, you really don't know the quality. You, it, unfortunately, you don't. Well, I was just thinking GNC in my head and you're like health food store because it's, it's like that's fast food. It's yeah. like it looks like a hamburger, but it's yeah, not really yeah, meat. Right, it's not yeah. the same as taking a steak, making ground beef, and putting it on a hot plate to you know or a grill to to bring out it, the best. It's like exactly. chemically stable, long shelf life. Yeah, no, you're right. And yeah. the big problem too is that you know they, a lot of companies they dump tons and tons of money into marketing. You know, it's but they put very little into the quality of the product. So they figure, okay, I'm going to sell this piece of garbage, but we're going to market the hell out of it and people are going to buy it and we're just going to you know get it out there. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know, we have plenty of we're we're they're hitting the masses. I have a really niche group obviously of people that are are purchasing stuff from me and it's it's based on my recommendations and it's I and I show people. I say, "Listen, this is the rationale behind why you want to take this." Because I'll show you the blood work and I'll show you the research behind it cuz Everything I use is all science-based. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, is there research showing that this will help with this or this will alleviate this or so that's that's a big part of it. You know, it's not, once again, individualized medicine. It's not a shotgun approach. Um, so and we're, we're, we're hitting a niche. Well, and you start with the observation, conversation, then the tests. You go to the numbers. Yeah. And then you add food, exercise, habit changes, and then you go back and check the numbers. You go back and, and check. And Proof so, is in the pudding. Right. I say it all the time. I say, listen, you know, and, and if it doesn't change, then we have a conversation. Is it is it something I did wrong? Did I recommend something that, that, that was off? Or are you not holding up your end of the bargain, you know? Um, and invite, you know, it can go either way. Maybe I, I misstepped and maybe we missed something. Maybe you needed this instead of this. And it's the, the beauty of using natural medicine is that you don't get in too much trouble, you know? If you, okay, I gave you this vitamin and instead of this one and we, we figure it out. But uh, yeah, I, I like I like the follow-up. A lot of doctors don't do the follow-up part, you know? They'll Or they'll... Um, Oh, you're you're feeling better, so we'll just take it as is, or, or that symptom is gone. Well, or you've had it for a while; it's now just part of life. Yeah, exactly. That's just, you're just getting older. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's <laughs> don't seek to be healthy anymore. That, yeah, that's a big part of it. You know, I I, I hear that a lot from uh, patients with that go see their doctor. Oh, you're getting oil. I got that too. You know, it's like the, you know, I, they're commiserating with their patient about you know their symptoms. It's like okay, well, it's not that's not normal. You know, it's like yes. We're all people will develop certain symptoms as we age, but it's not. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be the rule, you know. It shouldn't be that just when you hit this particular age, you're gonna fall apart, you know. So, yeah, we gotta we gotta st walk it back a little bit and kind of get back to our roots, and you know, we're we're we need to be more vital. I think you know when we look at our ancestors, how they used to live, you know, it's a lot different. We have way too many creature comforts. We're just, you know, we don't move around enough. Food is way too accessible. Bad food is way too accessible. Um, but also good food is too, you know, so you have to, which path are you going to choose? You can choose, you know, eating garbage and eating stuff because it's quick and convenient, or you can, you know, go the other way. Well, and it is interesting too, because nobody's feeding us. So it is our hands putting things in You're our right. mouths, right? And that's the, that's what's funny is that, you know, patients will come in and, and, uh, I'll go over, like, let's say they have high blood sugar or the high triglycerides. And I say, well, you know, oh, I don't know why it's like that. I don't know why the sugar is so high. I say, well, the blood, the sugar got into your blood somehow because you put it there. I go, someone in the middle of the night didn't infuse your blood with sugar. I go, and, and all these things. I go, it happened. Well, and then as you start talking, it start, then the truth comes out. You know what I mean? Well, maybe it was because of this, this, and this. And as I start giving more examples, they, they kind of fess up. Because no one wants to really get called out. But at the same time, you have to, you know, they're there for a reason. The patients are there. They're, they're there because they want my help and they want to, you know. And then some. Then there's some people that don't really want to hear it. You know, they... Some people may come to see me because it is a fad type of thing, you know. Oh well, I'll go see him and he'll I'll, he'll get me healthy. He'll get me. I'm not going to get you. You're going to get yourself healthy. I'm just going to give you the information that you need to achieve your goals. And if you do it 10% of the time, you're going to get 10% better. If you do it 100%, you're 
there's a good chance you'll get almost 100% optimal, you know? So I tell patients all the time, it's just as good as you want to feel. That's what it comes down to, how, how, how you do it, you know, and give yourself leeway. If you can't give up this one thing, okay, that's fine, but let's try doing these other things. I compromise all the time. We have to, you know, because it's better that they do two of the five things opposed to zero, <laughs> you know. I'll take what I can get with patients, and then, like, in the end, they know. They come back, and they, they put it on themselves. They stop trying to put it on other people. Stop playing that victim mentality type of thing, and that's one of the big problems, you know. So, I think it's all part of people taking control of their own lives, yeah. taking back their taking health. Taking back your health. Where can people download the book? Okay, so you can go to my website, uh, draida.com. So you go to draida.com forward slash ebook, and we'll have the link up there, and it'll be good. Good to go. Is the audio version going to be read by you? Yeah, I think I'm going to do that. It'll be m me talking, so. People know my voice now, so cool. Yeah, they enjoy it too. Uh, it's, Good. it's it's worthwhile. It's nutritious. People are. All, I'm always learning stuff I didn't know. Yeah. And as my doctor, I don't get to have these conversations all the time in the office. So no, you know, exactly, this is this yeah. is the interview skill. Yeah. You know? So after after I leave here, it kind of sparks you, right? <laughs> yeah, it does for sure. <laughs> and before you get here too. <laughs> yeah. All good. Right on. Well, thanks for coming. Thanks, my friend. And uh, I look forward to more people having this. I know all the students and graduates of my course are going to dig into this and oh, start to have questions. And you've already can't wait. Yeah. had And then I'll come back and we'll maybe we'll get some of these students on there and we'll answer some questions live even. Yeah, because you know? there's always a second edition in the making. Oh, we'll there's a second, there's a third. We'll there's going to be, yeah, we're going we're gonna to keep, keep it rolling from here. Yeah, because there's always information evolves that's the thing you know uh and i'm constantly evolving i'm doing things i'm doing now are a lot different than i was doing five years 10 years 15 years ago you know you evolve as you see more cases as the world changes we have to kind of adjust to that and as new science as new technology comes out yeah there's there's so much more that's why you know, when I wrote my my first book, it's evolved even from there. And that was only, you know, maybe four or five years ago. And it's just this book is just so much more. So fantastic. And I look forward to seeing more social media interviews now that you're going to have this sort of thing getting Absolutely. cut up and being put out. Yeah. And uh, let us know if you need help with that. All right. Great. All right. Thanks. Rich. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Peace.